No, that's, you're fine. It's just easier for people to hear your comments. Yeah, if they're here. Okay, Exodus 24 is the continuing story of the the post-Egyptian Israelites. And what we're going to at least touch upon tonight is the building of the tabernacle. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we move into the study. Uh, I wanted to finish up with a couple of questions in, uh, that we left from last week. Because there's a couple of things that are mentioned there. We often understand that in different ways, sometimes it's by prophecy that's uh, made and then fulfilled. Or maybe there's something that's just going on that then someone draws it to our attention and says that was something that was teaching us something about Jesus or the New Testament. And so in question one, I say, how does the sprinkled blood give meaning to the death of Christ. Now, this is the event in Exodus 24 and verse 15. It says, Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud, and to the eyes of the sons of Israel the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Now, when we consider this whole idea of what's found here in 24, verse 7 and 8, I got a little omissive there and left that one out, and that's something we need to actually read. This is talking about the glory of God and the comparison uh, as we read in question number two. But in Exodus chapter 24, uh, verse 15 through 17. Uh, Kenny, can you read that for us, please? Nice, correct, nice and loud, please. Sorry? No, I, no, yeah, I'm sorry, Kenny. Seven and eight. Okay, go ahead and read the next verse as well. What are you reading now? Is that verse 7? Okay, All right, that's far enough. I'm sorry. Yeah, I knew when I went ahead and used this tonight, I'd put the whammy on myself and exactly what I did. Okay, so there's a connection. It's the sprinkling of the blood. And the sprinkling of blood, the blood was done. Uh, I don't know that it was ever done again, but it was done uh, when the covenant was being established. Moses had been up on the mountain. He comes down, and now the people are going to connect with it, and he sprinkles blood in several places, but he sprinkles it on the people. Now, when you look at what's stated over in Hebrews chapter 9. And let's see if I can find that. The writer of Hebrews draws this to our attention and makes the, the connection to it. Now, one of the things that we know about the Old Testament way through the, Prayer, the, the priesthood of Aaron is that there was a lot of blood that was involved in this, right? And the blood came from what? The land, well, the sacrifices, the various sacrifices that were offered. And through those sacrifices, the people got a consciousness of sin. Now, in chapter 9 of uh, Hebrews, and I apologize for this being as print being as small as it is, but 
I think we'll all be able to survive. He says, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. Now, this is just the idea of, uh, I guess, a will and testament when you look at it that way, and everybody understands that principle. Whatever is designated by the individual, the one who passes, that carries itself out when the person dies. So our covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it's never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. It doesn't go into a great detail in explaining it. It just says that's the way it worked. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. And he says, he gives this validity to it. He says, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And accordance to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So that was the principle that was being stated. Now, when we begin to try to make the connection of this to you know, the New Testament, the Hebrew writer is doing it for us. And so he, he's telling us that Exodus 24 and what happens when the law was first taken down from the mountain and read before the people, and the people, what did they conclude after it was read? What did they say? We're going to do it. We're going to obey it. We promise that we're going to be ones who are going to lean toward the doing of God's will. It's going to be our desire. Now, the significance of, of the blood is obviously when you make the connection yourself. I don't want to get so caught up in this that we get all woolly in the details here, and I'm not sure it really helps us all this much. But there was blood in the Old Testament that was used, sacrifices that were made, and through that people understood the principle of forgiveness of sins through these sacrifices. All right, now, Jesus comes along, and the same thing is said about him. And the connection is made to his blood. Now, why would you think that would be necessary? What, what might be the point? Again, it's one of these things where the Hebrew writer doesn't explain it in great detail, but he puts in their own minds blood in the Old Testament, blood in the New. So what might be the purpose of that? Okay, to establish the covenant. Why make the connection, though, David, I guess is what I'm, I'm getting at here, is why might that be a problem, or why would it be worth bringing up? What did we know that they thought about the Messiah? Go ahead, Tammy. Okay. All right, so they, they understand. Go ahead. Right, so they're making some, they'll be able to make a connection with what happened in the Old Testament. But what was it that the people struggled with this morning in terms of Jesus and what he did? Go ahead, Daniel. You don't have to answer that. Just go ahead. Uh, the Israelites at that time were thinking of a physical Messiah. Okay. So they had shed his blood for the covenant to be straight. Explain why that's done. Yeah, and so that was intended to be a way of preparing people before that, for that. I, now, again, I don't know that if you go through and you put together all the pieces and you study commentaries and things like that, what, what might the conclusion be that would draw you so close to this idea? But at least by inference, we can understand that the dying Messiah did not fit. And so anyone who might be questioning it that at this point in time, because what do we know now about the, the Hebrews? Oh, excuse me. There we go. What do we, know, what do we know about these ones, these Christians at this time? Why is the, why is the letter to the Hebrews written? Yeah, go ahead, Mitch. Right. Yeah, 
Yeah, and so if some are questioning that, then this might be a way of having them come to an understanding that the old law taught us the significance of blood. Jesus is dying, and of course, he brings such a much better tone of truth and activity in terms of the service of God, because what are the Old Testament priests doing? They're offering things that are given to them or purchased for them. And Jesus comes along, and what does he do to show his superiority? He, sorry, what? You don't, you don't need to do that anymore because he offered it, and it was one at a time. It was the only sacrifice that was needed. So I think that that's probably a reasonable thing to, you know, to consider here in terms of the whole concept of why this would be brought up. The writer of Hebrews is obviously very knowledgeable in uh, what we would call the Old Testament. And so he, he says, Let, let's look at this. Let's look at how the covenant was established and what was so essential to that in the representation of Moses and what he did. And so when someone comes along then and says, well, I just don't understand why the Messiah had to die, and we know there certainly had to be people who did question it because even his own followers questioned the actual event itself. So there is a connection that's being made there, and it's one of the reasons why I think it's significant for us to understand the significance of... Uh, Understanding the significance of the Old Testament and then the fulfillment of it in Christ. Now, why would that be a way uh, that would be an effective way to teach these people like those individuals? What did Paul, what, how did Paul go about teaching them as we read and study about what he did? He taught them as a Jew, but what do you mean by that? Okay, so Judy says uh, they spoke, he spoke their language, he understood what they were talking about. I mean, this would be a, probably a natural thing that would be brought to the attention of these people. Yeah, Rich? Right. Yeah, because he makes it clear a number of times in the book of Hebrews. You know, we, we look at this from the perspective of Jesus being better than what was. That's how it was presented. And so there are various things that came along. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to the priesthood. And the sacrifices that were being offered, which served their place, but they were not of the ability to really take away one's sins. And so Christ comes along, and he fulfills that. And so the purpose then, I guess, if you were going to look at it from the fulfillment standpoint. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily that the reason why the writer of Exodus, certainly Moses in, in many cases, um, not every part of it, but it's believed he wrote most of it. He's writing this. I don't think he understands exactly what the fulfillment is, but the writer of Hebrews is saying that's what that was talking about. And so, again, it's a powerful thing. Why is prophecy a powerful thing uh, to use as a mode of teaching? You have no idea, huh? Excuse, go ahead, Cindy. Okay, because it's fulfilled. And so it's, point out, it's pointed out, that's what she said. Right, it, it establishes. I mean, someone might be thinking, well, why would they do that? Why all these sacrifices? Why this bloodshed? Why the sprinkling of blood 
upon you know, the, the, the writing and on the people and all those things? Well, because it's trying to point people to the significance and the importance of blood. And that is, of course, the death of Christ. All right, now, there's another question here, uh, question number two, which makes another connection, and it's from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7, 11. It says that the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not intently look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, and how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. So what's the comparison being made here? What's, what's the ministry of condemnation? That's the, the old law, salvation through the old law. Not that it was bad, not that it was evil. Some people get kind of offended by that when you begin to look uh, in a negative way at the Old Testament. But we've t discussed this many times. Why would it be referred to as the ministry of condemnation? Okay, so through that, one has the knowledge of sin, but not the salvation or the forgiveness of sin. That's the principle that's lined up there. So the question is, is Paul likely speaking of the events in chapter 24, verse 15 through 17? Let's see if I can locate that again. Okay, going to have to go back here somewhere. I'm glad all of you are so patient. Uh, so where did it go, uh, Vance? I'm looking for it here, and it's... Uh, can I do what? No. Are you getting married or something? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and fix it for me. I've been bumping it with my hands numerous times. Well, it's a gift. Yeah. Okay. Got to see if it'll, it'll move. Oh, now that's cute. <laughs> I did that all by myself. I don't even know how you did that, to be honest. <laughs> well, I'm impressed with how you fixed it. It's not fixed yet. Yeah. All right. Where are you trying to get to? I want to go back to where these the scriptures are early on in the yeah. in the production here. Okay. Um, 24:15. I think that may be in the beginning, but it was wrongly placed there. There we go. That's it. Okay. Okay. Good. Wait, 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 wait. Let's get it. Well, Carrie just said page up. I have no idea what that means. Let's try this one more time, and I'm going to do comedy staff. All we got to do is just go to... Here we go. Okay. Now, we have been there before. This doesn't look right here, so... Yeah, I know, but it's not, it's not connected with this. 
Okay, let's look at, let's just go ahead and read the uh, 24, 15 through 17, which I think we did already read it. I can read it here. And it was about Moses going up on the mountain, and he comes down, and it's the glory of God is visible in a, in a rather amazing sort of way. And it really was one of those things that caught the people, I think, by surprise in some respects, and it was so amazing. But nevertheless, they knew something great had happened. And so there's this comparison that's made with Second Second. Corinthians chapter 7, when it is talking about what? The ministry of what versus what? The ministry of condemnation versus the ministry that comes or produces Christ. All right, now, and so what he's saying also in 2 Corinthians 3 is if that had glory, the Old Testament, and what Moses brought forth, well then certainly what Jesus brings forth is certainly full of more glory. Now, it's probably not talking about Exodus 24, even though the word glory is used. Generally speaking, I think when you look at what the individual is talking about, Paul, the writer in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, um, he is uh, presenting uh, him, himself as being one who's trying to help people to understand that what they have through, through Jesus is greater than what they had through Moses. So, he says in verse 12, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the old covenant at the same veil, in the same veil, excuse me, the same veil which remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. In other words, He's saying that there's still a veil there. They, there. There needed to be some protection from how Moses looked. Now, the glory that, you know, that's talked about in, in uh, Exodus 24 is the glory of the whole experience of, of the mountain and what happened when Moses went up on the mountain and all the things that were, that were so powerful. But... I asked the question, I said, well, is it a reasonable explanation? Now, it may be a better explanation uh, found over in Exodus 34. Because there was something that really connects rather strongly to this, and maybe more specifically to this, uh, again, with Moses and his experience. Look at Exodus 34, verse 29. It says, It came about when Moses was coming down from the Mount Sinai, this was after they reproduced, if you will, the tablets. Uh, he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So here's Moses. He's been in the presence of the glory of God, and he doesn't realize the physical effect it's had on him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them and to Aaron, and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out, he spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded. The sons of Israel would see the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. 
Okay, so this was a problem. But one of the things we read in another place is that eventually what would happen was that that veil would not be necessary. It would be removed. Because the glory, if you will, disappeared. You know, what this incredible evidence was of his being with God. And so here again is another way of teaching us. Now, it could be the Exodus 24 passage. Certainly, the principle is there. But it more likely is the, the whole event from Exodus chapter 29 or 34. That the glory was amazing when they saw that Moses had been in the presence of God. But that would eventually fade. Now, what Jesus has done, there's a oneness about what he has done, what he has done is that he has gone to the work of sacrifice and he died and it only had to happen how many times according to the Hebrew letter? One time. And so he compares it. He said, well, yes, Moses had a great experience when he was up there with God and the people were really, really impressed, but eventually the glory would pass away. But what we have from God through Jesus it doesn't pass away. And so that's what makes it so much better. Now, again, in understanding those two particular passages and trying to put some meaning to it, again, it's one of these things where I just think it's important and significant for us to know. A lot of it, it, it may not say, and this was fulfilling that particular event, or this was pointing to the time when this would happen to the Messiah. We have to take some time to try to understand it and figure it out. And so here at the beginning, when things are, I mean, just seemingly at times marvelous and powerful and full of glory, and then it wouldn't take long for circumstances because of the disobedience of the people for things to fall by the wayside in terms of the relationship that these people would have with God. So, despite all the chaos that we had up here with the slides, um, do, do you understand you know, the, the point here and why it's significant and why it's significant that the writer of Hebrews would use it? The writer of Hebrews used a lot of what's in the Old Testament to make and establish his point that Jesus was finally and truly the Messiah. And I think we're intended to have the same sort of experience when we see these things and we read them and we, we see the power in these things that were written long, the experience <clears throat> long before. We're talking about around 1400 B.C. when these events happen. <clears throat> and they then become fulfilled in Christ all those years later. To a person who is curious to a person who is wanting to understand God and his truth and why it should be believed, this is something that's going to click with people, and they're going to get some sense of meaning out of it. Okay, any comments or questions about that? Let me just like run through the slides a little bit here and just entertain you with that. I had some real purdy pictures too. That's the sad part of the whole thing. And I'm sure I can get them. But maybe we'll have another show another time. Let's go down to Exodus 25, question 3. This is kind of an interesting concept. Especially, you know, when we think most of the time when the people of Israel were obeying God, they were obeying God because God said, this is the way it's going to be. So there would be no question, you know, of how you'd go about doing it. You know, you, you do what you do because God says that's what you do. But in Exodus chapter 25, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. This is the contribution which you are to raise from them, gold, silver, and bronze, and then a bunch of other things that are there. Okay, so I asked the question, how do the people financially support the building of the sanctuary. 
That's what we're talking about here. This is, it's an amazing structure uh, in terms of the things that are in it. And I'm sure at one time or another, someone has determined what it would, uh, what it would cost. But, but nevertheless, they're, they're getting ready to engage it. Go ahead, Janine. Okay, I mean, that, if we're looking for where, from where it might have come, that's a pretty reasonable way of looking at it, that that's, that that's what happened. Uh, in fact, it seemed like as they're going out the door and things are so crazy and uh, Pharaoh was so upset with them that they're, they're giving them things just to get them to go away faster. So... <clears throat> Yeah, it's possible. Some of the, the booty from warfare, I suppose that's possible uh, as well. But uh, it's, a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of gold. <clears throat> and um, they obviously wouldn't have much of it. They'd just be carrying around. I mean, the, the nation all had their hands on a treasury or anything like that. They all had something that they collected and they had it with them. And so <clears throat> he says, get the people together and have them do it in a voluntary sort of way. So what, what about us? Is our, is our service to God voluntary? Absolutely. Sure, it, it is voluntary uh, because you have a choice. You can choose to volunteer. It's just like uh, if, you, if you make the decision to go into the, the military, you, know, you volunteer to go into the military or whatever it is you may do. So <clears throat> that doesn't make it... I, I guess what, what I'm looking at here, some people might have... What, what might this have created here if some people are more capable of giving more than others? <clears throat> Does that create any, create any sort of problems of a social nature that any of you can imagine? <clears throat> it could be. It could be that <clears throat> depending on how much someone had, and you know, he would be able... Remember Ananias and Sapphira? I mean, that situation is a little bit like this. I mean, they wanted to look like they had a whole lot more money than what they actually did. So, I mean, that's possible. <laughs> but we don't want to take, you know, away from this, you know, the, the purity of it all. Look at, uh, since uh, Janine raised it, look back to Exodus chapter 12. It's verse 35 and 36, I believe. Okay, here is the Exodus account. The Egyptians, verse 33, urged the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, which that was the plan, they didn't want to have anything that was leavened, so they would be prepared. With their kneading bowls, bound up the clothes on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Now, it's, it seems like a little bit of a conflict here you know, for me. So the impression that you get there, uh, the people were going to do this because they had a good feeling about the people of Israel. I mean, that's what it kind of sounds like in the text, doesn't it? The Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So, I mean, you can have your own ideas about how that might have happened. But nevertheless, the people wanted to help them or were going to help them because they wanted them to, to get away. Because it goes on to say, so that they let them have their request, thus they plundered the Egyptians. So what does the word plundered kind of suggest? Took everything they had. Yeah. So, I mean, that gives me a pretty good sense that in their hands of all the hundreds of thousands of people, many people had stuff, and so... It wasn't like what Moses was asking was something that was going to be impossible. I mean, it was understood that they had it. I think that's you know, pretty clear to me. So, it's now time to begin building this thing. 
And so the question in, that I ask from chapter 25 and verse 8 of Exodus is, of course, what was the purpose of the sanctuary? It's pretty simple after being told all the things that uh, they could use to build it. It says, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. So what's the purpose of this tent that they're building? It's a dwelling place for God. And it's, I guess what you might call a, a temporary one. Um, it's something, it's, we know that it certainly is not considered to be something that's going to be staying in one place because, number one, what do we know about what they're going to be doing for the next 40 years? They're going to be wandering around. But they were going to have a place where they could go and meet with God, so to speak, in the sanctuary. All right, now, so when one considers the purpose of it, then you start thinking about, well, okay, after the sanctuary the tabernacle wore out its need then what replaced it the temple that was built by by solomon okay that lasted a while and eventually it was destroyed uh, by the babylonians rebuilt a couple of times before the coming of the time of jesus but nevertheless there was always a place okay that when jesus came and he fulfilled what was meant by what God was trying to do all the time by doing the things that they were doing in the Old Testament, then who became the temple? The individuals became the temple. We are the temple of God. Uh, in the Corinthian letter, it refers to us as individually being uh, one uh, who are our own individual temples. And then the whole church is... Uh, is considered. You need to think of yourself as being the dwelling place of God. Now, what might that motivate people to think uh, in, in a positive way, particularly for those people who knew about the law of Moses and they knew about the tabernacle? What might that motivate them? How might it motivate them? Well, if they're, if they're wanting to be the people of God and God always builds one of these places and now he says, you are now it, then it's going to create a bond. It should be one where one realizes this is very serious business as being a part of God's church or God's temple. And what a, an amazing thing to understand how it connects with how it was first built, the tabernacle that was carried about as something that they always wanted. Let's see. Let's see what happens if I actually try to do something here without trying to make it right. Yeah, okay, good point, Dave. All right, now, I, what's happening here is uh, I can't move it one way or the other, so uh, we'll just leave it at that. But I just want to know what you, want you to know what you missed. You know. All right, now. Now, Richard, if you saw what I'm looking at right now on this screen here, not this one here, you would have no faith that we could, we could do that. So I'll let some of you, you geniuses who get frustrated with this kind of inadequacy, you can do th stuff about it if you want. Okay. Um, question number four said, how, what's the purpose of it? it it's so we can have a God who will dwell with us. And then what we have then is all these things that are what we call the furnitures or furniture of what's going to be built in and for the tabernacle. And so 
I ask you about the, the, the showbread and as, as an example of one that we might be able to understand. Uh, look in Luke, uh, uh, excuse me, in Exodus 25, verse 23 through 30. This is a table, the table of showbread. You shall make a table of acacia wood, uh, two cubits long and one cubit wide and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a gold border around it. You shall make for it a rim of a handbreadth around it, and you shall make a gold border for the rim around it. And you shall make four gold rings for it and put the rings on the four corners which are on its four feet. The rings shall be close to the rim as the holders of the poles to do what? To carry it. So each one of these things, whether it's the altar of incense, whether it's this, which is the, the altar of burnt offerings, or it's the Ark of the Covenant, all of these things were built in a way to... Uh, Like a, it's like a little butterfly just coming through. Very cute. Okay, so someone help me read. Daniel, Stitt, go ahead and read this. Chapter 25, read the rest of it. Uh, start with uh, uh, verse 28 through 30. Yeah, chapter 25, verse 28 through 30. Okay, now, this may have had some sort of connection to manna, but it, it had a very practical usage uh, because it was for the people, most of the people who are going to be handling all of these items, and who's that going to be? The, the priests. They're the, going to be the ones that are going to handle it, and, uh, and the Levites, priests and Levites. All right, now, so go ahead and turn over, uh, skip, let's look at Leviticus 24, uh, one through four, and then five through nine, and then we'll call it a, an evening. Leviticus twenty-four, one through four. Uh, Jeff Marshall, could you read that? And then uh, Scott, you read five through nine. This is a description of the bread that's on this table that's been described. Go ahead, Jeff. Good, Scott. And you shall take fine flour and make twelve cakes with it, two tenths of one eighth of an inch in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord, and you shall set them pure frankincense and stuff, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, and offering be by fire to the Lord. Each Sabbath you shall Okay, so it's, it's going to be bread, a special bread that the priesthood, they're going to eat it. It's going to be 12 loaves. I assume that represents the 12 tribes. And uh, it would sit there during the week, and then when would it be eaten? On the Sabbath day, the priest would eat it. So there are various rituals directed by God about a lot of these other things, and I want to try to, if I can get this thing working correctly next week, 
I at least want to talk to you a little bit more about the pieces of furniture. So again, I apologize for this evening and uh, appreciate your willingness to uh, be patient with me. Thank you. <laughs>